I don't know what to say after those two beautiful lectures of Dr. Medina and uh, Dr. Marco, who took uh, the uh, presentation to a different, uh, different uh, whole level. It was like a Hollywood show business. And uh, the way Dr. Medina presents is like a, a big challenge to me. Well, I, I'm going to do my best. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Charlie for giving me this chance to be among, among you today. Uh, it's a great convention. I like the country. It's the first time I'm in Italy. And uh, definitely, Como is really beautiful, but I didn't have even the chance to look at the lake yet. Uh, so uh, maybe this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, my wife and my family, my kids, my daughters. My wife, in the, uh, it's, she's in the middle, she's holding the cake, and uh, she's here with me, she's my support, she's my rock, so I thank her for keeping up with me and being patient. And uh, I live in, uh, as uh, Emrik said with the, his uh, kind words, I live in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, Beirut is a very, uh, Lebanon is a very small country in the Middle East, and the capital is Beirut, and uh, we have a be very beautiful scenery and nature, and uh, I, I'm, I'm very happy to welcome you whenever you come there. And uh, I graduated in 1993 from the uh, St. Joseph University, which is a French university, so I got my uh, dental degree in 1993, and soon after that, I traveled to Finland, a uh, complete different nature, like six months of uh, snow uh, per year. But it was actually nothing to do but study there. So I spent three years. I studied in the University of Kuopio, which is now uh, the University of uh, uh, Eastern Finland. And it was quite an exquisite experience, because I just want to tell you something about the university. This lake is frozen for six months, and students come on skis. So they park their skis, they go into university, even the dean of the university used to do that. So I was a bit shocked. <laughs> and uh, I practice in Lebanon uh, with my brother. My brother, actually, he's older than me. He's a periodontist who graduated from France. And uh, he's based in Dubai. So he, he's actually, uh, he's like my mentor. He taught me a lot. Because if you want to practice orthodontics and you don't understand anything about perio, uh, you're going to hit a wall. So for me, periodontics is very important, OK? And um, we have a small practice. And uh, Dr. Yamin and uh, uh, Charlie also mentioned about the Facebook page that I created a couple of years ago for the genius lovers. So I just want to ask you one question. How many of you have used genius? Can you raise your hands, please? OK, great. What about the rest, guys? What are you waiting for? Maybe after my lecture. Okay, and I practice also in Dubai, so it's been almost 20 years. I travel to Dubai 10 days every month, so uh, uh, it's, a, it's a nice practice. It's called Riviera Medical and Dental Center. Charlie, you visited there. It's state of the art. We're like a small group of uh, Lebanese uh, doctors, and I'm the only orthodontist there. And uh, Charlie, we spend a great time. I happen to now have a close relationship with him. As we say in English, he's like my brother from another mother. So I just want to uh, take you uh, quickly on a small journey. Um, this is the arrow is my life, OK? And actually, this small picture, this is me. I was three years old, OK? I had hair, so uh, please. <laughs> and I, my first, I graduated in 1996. And in 1997, my, my, when I was uh, opening up my practice in Beirut, I started working in Dubai, actually, as soon as I, I, I graduated. And I got my first solo case. And in, in, uh, in, in Finland, we got trained in so many techniques. So uh, we trained in Tweed and in, 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 uh, uh, in Alexander technique. And then through the years, I changed from one technique to the other. So I, I'm, I know how to work with tweed. I'm not, I'm not very good at it. I, I'm, I'm excellent in, in, in the Alexander technique because he was one of our teachers in, in, in Finland. I had to learn a lot uh, from Burston because uh, I think like after five years of graduation, you want to you wanna convince yourself that you're, you're like a guru in mechanics. So the more things you get complicated in the patient, the more comfortable you feel. But like Dr. Medina said, it's the simple things that are difficult in life to do. No, you can complicate your cases, but this doesn't mean you're a good orthodontist. And after that, I, I switched in, uh, to Roth and MBT because I wanted to make things a little bit more simple, okay? Like straight wire, work less, okay? Think more and work less. Now, if you bend wires, you're gonna think less and work more. And what really uh, this 
distinguish us as orthodontists like we have, we have good brains, we have big brains. So we know how to think, okay? So thinking more and working less is something that you need to learn how to do. In 2006, I joined the um, great Korean team from the uh, Kyungpung National University. I guess you already know Dr. Kyung, Dr. Park, Dr. Bae, and Dr. Sung. They were like my mentors in, in uh, micro implants. So it's been almost now 15 years we travel together. Uh, we give lectures in, uh, I already gave in the United States, uh, in, uh, in Tunisia, in Morocco, uh, Asia, uh, uh, China, Korea. Uh, Malaysia, Thailand, I, I can't remember, but it's like we have once or twice per year a meeting for microimplants, and actually they taught me everything I know about microimplants. And in 2006, it was important because it changed a little bit my life, so it was like a milestone, okay? Before 2006, I had problems with my cases, but I know how to get out of the problems, okay? Very, d with, with a lot of difficulty. Using microimplants helped me to reduce those problems, okay? But I'm not happy with that, because there are two different kinds of orthodontists in the world, okay? In my opinion. It's the orthodontists who work, they expect the problem, they know how to solve it. And we all started like this. But the orthodontist that I want to be, and I would like to be, and I strive to be, is the orthodontist who works, eliminates the problem before it happens. That's a different kind of orthodontist. That's a different level, okay? That's somebody who can inspire students and other orthodontists to work. It's easy to get into problems and know how to get out of it. It's more difficult to eliminate the problem before it happens, and that's a different ball game in orthodontics. In 2018, as Charlie said in the uh, opening uh, speech, and I don't know if you were here to, to listen to him, I stumbled on genius by surprise. So I was in uh, uh, South Korea with the Korean team. We had the Congress there, and Dr. Park came to me, and he saw me looking at the stand of Dentos, uh, the, uh, the company that sells Apso Anchor, the famous mic uh, Korean microimplant. I was opening the genius bracket set, and he said, uh, have you heard about this? I said, no. He said, okay, come on, take two sets, go back to Lebanon, and put them. And this was in September in 2018. And uh, as I went to Beirut, I, I took those two cases, I put them on patients, and in January, I was so happy after three months, I didn't know who, to, who sells those brackets, okay? So I, I searched on the internet, and believe me, I mean, this is a true story. So I found Orto Partner and Charles El Kubi. So I contacted them and I said, I want brackets. And he was so nice, he sent me the first set of 10 brackets. And since then, I'm in love with the system. Really, I'm in love with the system. And here we are in 2021. I'm a, a newcomer to the, to, the, to the game, not like Ephraim or Emrik or uh, doc, uh, Dr. Catherine or all the people who use Genius. But I think I can share with you some of the things that I love about the system. So, of course, you know, you know those two, right? On the left side is my idol in tennis, he's Roger Federer. And on the right side, anybody knows who this guy is? The Italian people. Who's this? <laughs> Niki Lauda. So why did I put this, uh, this, this slide? You know, if you're born with the talent of those two people, and you're an orthodontist, take your bags and go out. Go see the lake. You don't need to listen to me. You don't lead, need to listen to any orthodontist. If you're born with the talent, like Roger Federer, you can win Wimbledon with a broom. You know, with the broom. Okay, he's so talented, he doesn't need a racket. Well, he uses it just to amuse people. And if you're as talented as Niki Lauda, you can win a Formula One ra race with a bicycle. There's a story about Niki Lauda, and I think it's true. He wanted to join Ferrari, so he went to the uh, track. Enzo Ferrari was there. And he saw the driver in the Ferrari car doing the laps. He went to Enzo and he told him, if I sit in that car, I can reduce the lap by two seconds. And you know, back in the 1950s and 60s, there was no computers, there was nothing. It was the talent of Niki Lauda. He sat in the car, he drove in a way that he reduced the lap by two and a half seconds, and he became the primary uh, driver for Formula One for Ferrari. 
I don't have the talent of Niki Lauda or the talent of Federer in orthodontics. I'm a regular orthodontist, and I show you before my, my life. I struggled so that I can get here. I tried to find the system that gets me as close as possible in orthodontics to Niki Lauda and Federer in Formula One or in tennis. So why did I choose all those techniques? Because I want this. I mean, I don't want the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I want this smile. I want those central incisors. And those ladies, they're not in their 20s. They're in their late 30s, early 40s. Look at this. Matthew McConaughey, he's a US actor. He's in, the, he's in his early 40s. Look at the smile. If your patients who are 12, 13, 14, they smile like this, it's good. What happens when they're 30 or 40? The lip is going to drop. The nose is going to grow. The chin is going to grow. He's 30 or she's 30, but they're going to lick 50. So now I'm obsessed with the social, social six. I want this six front teeth to shine. So I want to see my patients whenever they go in school, in classes, in university, at any ceremony, I want them to be the stars. What, how? By giving them this. So. My pre-genius years, the years that I used other systems, and I feel they are like dumb and dumber, those genius year, pre-genius years. So I'm going to show you quickly how I used to do things. This is a 13-year-old girl. She came to the clinic because of crowding, no place for the canines. We know that constricted uh, upper jaw, moderate crowding in the lower. I was trained okay, to expand with RPE control then the vertical, and then control the AP, the sagittal. It doesn't work like this anymore. With genius, we do everything at the same time. Why? Dr. Medina said, because we have the technology to do it. So I started with an RPE, expanded the upper arch, created the space for the canine. Actually, I don't know how much force I'm putting on that RPE. It's more than a kilogram on each side. And some people say that light forces are going to create fenestration and dehiscence. But what about RPE? Is it light force? It's not. It's an orthopedic force, but nobody says why are you creating dehiscence and fenestration with RPE. Nobody talks about this anymore because it's something that it's evidence-based, but it's not. It's not, not everything which is evidence-based is true, okay? There's something called clinical orthodontics, and I show you case after case where you can see the conclusion I'm getting at. So expansion with the RPE, 16 stainless steel on the upper with omega loops because I want to preserve the space that I created in the diastema, close the central incisors. So I started with a stainless steel in the lower coil spring to create space and look at those elastic modules or the O-rings, how can you create space on a nickel titanium wire, which is supposed to create for you 50 grams of force and you have elastomeric modules? It's not going to work. It's not going to work because you need more force. So now you're into the trap of exceeding the biologically accepted force. You create your own problems, not my fault. We do that every day. Remember, what type of orthodontist do you want to be? Do you want to be the orthodontist who creates the problem but goes home instead of sitting with the, with, with the family, having fun, thinks about the problem that, that he created so that you can correct them the next day? Or you want to be the kind of orthodontist that finishes the clinic knowing that everything is going the proper way, go home, enjoy his time with the family. I don't want to be the first guy. I had enough of that. After that, Nickel titanium on the upper, again, obsessed with the smile back then, bonding so high because I want to show those central incisors, and we finished in this. Do I like the finish? It's okay. Do I like it now? No, I don't. I can do better than this now. 30 months, oh my God. Patients since one year and a half nagging, when am I going to remove those braces? 30 months is too much for this kind of problems. Another case. Patient, 15 years of age, I don't like my smile. What's the problem? Class 2, Division 1, it's not severe, okay? But I don't want to use class 2 elastics. Why? Because I've been trained 
like all of you, like so many orthodontists in the world, that you need to wait for the class two elastic so you can use heavy ones on stainless steel arch wires, okay? Then you can use class two to correct your class two problem. Well, we don't do that, I don't do that anymore. So I wanted to, uh, I don't want to tax the lower incisors, so I don't want to use class two elastics on heavy arch wires, and I decided to use infrazygomatic uh, uh, infra uh, 12 millimeters uh, screws, because I'm good in screws. I learned everything from the Korean. I love using screws. I use them every day. But to, I'm going to tell you a secret. Since I started using Genius, the number of screws that I place have been cut to half, because I don't have anchorage problems anymore. So I use two screws, two by 12, in the infrazygomatic uh, area, and stainless steel arch wire retracting the whole upper arch, we call it whole arch upper, whole upper arch distalization. But you see this auxiliary on the upper teeth? You see that? It's called anterior root torquing spring. We add it because we lost torque. Why did I lose torque? Even though in this case, I'm using a bidimensional technique from Rocky Mountain, which means the four upper anterior teeth, four upper anterior brackets are 18 slot, Everything rest is 22. Why do I use that? Because I can use an 1825 stainless steel, place it in the uh, upper four anterior brackets, and express 100% degree of the torque. I'm supposed to do that. Still, with the bidimensional technique, I lost torque. So I had to add something on my system, which is the ART, leave it for three months. It's a waste of time. I don't need to buy ARTs anymore when I'm using Genius. So those are the 212, beautiful finish. Nice smile, but it took a lot of time. So I felt in my pre-genius years that I'm trapped like a mouse in a cage. In which type of cage? This cage. Hi, I'm using a system which has a high resistance to sliding. Oh, models, doors that, you know, uh, uh, brackets that ha don't have good quality. So high resistance to sliding is going to lead to using excessive force in your night tie wires, which is going in their turn to lead to slow tooth movement, unwanted side effects, and loss of anchorage. Now, I know how to get out of this problem. I can extend the treatment time. I can use micro implants, but I, I want to find something else. So am I being efficient? I'm not. What is, what is efficiency? It's a, it's a word we, we, we've been hearing all our lives as orthodontists. Efficiency in a very simple explanation is you do what's necessary to get the best possible outcome. You don't work a lot to get what you want. You just work what you need to work. Then you become efficient. So what is the solution? Is the conventional braces, braces the solution? I compare the com conventional braces to a Renault 5. Now, please don't get me wrong. I know that it's, an, it's a French icon car, and I love it, you know, because I grew up seeing in Beirut all those, you know, new Renault 5. And to, to, to give you a, 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 a historical uh, information, it won the best car in Europe maybe for five years in a row. But this was back in the 1980s. Now, if you want to drive this car to go home or to go to the work, it's okay, fine. But it's not automatic. It doesn't have an air conditioning. It doesn't have a sunroof, no LED lights. You want to open the windows, you have to do it manually. It's okay with you. It's, I mean, I don't mind. Okay, I don't mind. But you want to live in the 1980s? That's your problem. So if conventional brackets are not the solution, is passive self-ligation is the solution? Two small uh, papers comparing Damon and conventional. And uh, we, we in self-ligation, even with Genius, we owe everything we know, like the self-ligation system, we owe it to the Damon people, and we have to give them credit. So Damon patients require, on average, 47.8% fewer appointments. So the 30-month patient I can treat with less time. And the amount of time required for leavening and aligning with conventional was six months versus 3.2. How does that affect the marketing in my clinic? If I have a crowded case, I put conventional braces, after six months, the patients and the parents feel the difference. If I put in the same patient, passive self-ligation, I can see the difference after three months. 
I'm happy, patient's happy, parents keep on paying. Another uh, uh, small paper, light clinical force application permits anchorage conservation because of low friction. So passive self-ligation requires less anchorage problem. That's why I told you a couple of minutes ago that I don't use as many micro implants as I used before, because I can preserve my anchorage. So So is passive self-ligation the solution? In my opinion, yes. But what type of brackets are you going to buy? That's very important. So which system I would use? I would use a system which has a precision in manufacturing, not only of the bracket, but of the wires. It's a system. It's not a bracket. It's everything that you do that makes a big difference. For me, it's a 21 0.5 by 21 by 27.5, which makes the whole difference in my life. Why? A smaller slot gives me much better, better control when I get to my rectangular stainless steel wires. If the system tells me, because the, the torque on the central incisors in the Genius system is plus 14. So if I go to the, my last wire, which is 1925, I'm sure I'm going to get out of the 14, 7. And 7 is a, it's a magical number. Why? Because Dr. Andrews, in his early article about six keys to normal inclusion, everybody read it, right? When we did our uh, studies. He said that perfect teeth for people who don't need orthodontic treatment have a plus seven degrees of torque. So if I put my 1925 stainless steel in my 21 and a half by 27 and a half, out of the 14 degrees of the genius, I get the seven. Hi, Mr. Andrews. I feel you. I'm here. OK? And this system is user friendly. Why? One prescription, not like Dr. Medina called them our cousins, right? So one prescription fits all. It's like the musketeers. One for all, all for one. So in, with one prescription, I can treat class twos, class threes, open bites. I can do everything. So it's a user friendly. I can control my torque, and it's a very efficient system. So I compare the, the genius to a Tesla. I don't have money to buy Tesla, but I see it so much in Dubai. And you know, it causes me what we call the syndrome of neck turning. So it's a beautiful car. And lately, I've known that there is a system in Tesla that if it's covered with snow, with your remote control, you can heat it up and the snow would melt. That would be nice if we have it with genius. <laughs> so I'm going to show you four cases. Okay, I've chosen those uh, four cases on a purpose because each one of them, each case is different than the other. And I have a lot of cases, but I only have one hour, maybe less, right? 15 minutes. So I'm going to start with the first one. This case is 17 year old male. Hyperdivergent by maxilla, by maxillary uh, protrusion in the upper and the lower, and with an overjet of eight millimeter. I was taught in Finland, which, which was a great program. I mean, I, I love it. And over the years, with the pre-genius years, to look first at the AP sagittal, that's strong. Okay, the the dimension that we forget to look about first is the transverse. If you can deal with the transverse and you can develop the arches properly when they need to be done like that, half of the problems in your case are done. So train your eyes to look at the transverse first. When I look at the transverse, I see there's, it's a huge constriction. So there's something for me to do there. This case is definitely a surgical case, okay? Because he doesn't have a chin, he has a convex profile, he has a protruding nose. So all kinds of problems in orthodontics are in this case. But when the, when the patient is 17, he comes with his mom, and they said, no surgery, because we've seen doctors before, and they told us that he needs surgery. Can you do something about it? Okay, no promises there. I'm going to do my best, okay? So I decided to treat this case non-extraction, non-surgical. A big challenge, okay? But remember, the system, I have confidence in it. So severe constriction on the upper and the lower, 
And just I want to remind you to keep an eye on that second premolar, which is too small at the end. Look at the Ceph. Now, again, I don't look at Cephs anymore. It's very confusing. It's keep, it, it, it throws me off. On Cephs, you can see cases that need extraction, but at the end, you'll see with this case that the Ceph and the facial features are completely different. So, but this needs training. This needs your eyes to look for things. So I started with the first month, 14 thermal ultra, very low forces, keep them. One month, two months, three months, as long as your 14 thermal ultra is not completely straight, don't change it. There's always a force in it to give. I tell my students in, 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 uh, in, the, in the university, stainless steel is a very you know, generous wire. You give it force, it, it wants to give it back automatically. Uh, uh, nickel titanium thermal ultra wires are very stingy. They like to keep everything for them and give it to you stage by stage. So use this, keep it. I ask the patient to wear crisscross elastic so we can expand the upper arch, okay? The help of the night eye wire and the crisscross elastics. And this is after the third month. Things are looking much better than the first, mo first month. And I always like to see his smile. So I'm focusing on the four or six anterior teeth. And you see the coupling hooks that we use on the uh, uh, lingual side, palatal side of the, pre, uh, of the molars, so the patient can attach those crisscross elastics. They're not more than 2 to 2.5 ounce, and he has to wear them every day, day and night, and he has to change twice per day, once in the morning, once in the evening, so I can keep the level of the elastics as constant as possible. Okay, so this is the third month. And this is the fifth month, I'm still with the 14 thermal ultra, okay? I can start to see a little bit of development of the arch. Once you develop the arches and the transverse, automatically you're gonna notice that your front teeth are gonna stick in a little bit because you created that space. Teeth don't like space, they like to fill them. So once you develop the arches, those small spaces that you created, probably you don't see the front teeth are gonna go inside. So this is going to help me reduce the overjet and correct the class two. On the sixth month, I switched to 18 thermal ultra, but now I have the class two to deal with. Okay, so I started with micro implant, IZC on the seven. Here I'm using 1.88 millimeters because I want to be close, uh, uh, closer a little bit to the center of resistance. And I'm distalizing with a little bit of tipping. So I want to tip the anterior teeth more down, but not too much. That's why I'm not using long screws. And again, Kaplan hooks on the upper molars so we can continue the expansion and expansion on the lower. So I'm doing everything at the same time. Arch development in the transverse, micro implant to correct the class two, uh, um, uh, crisscross elastics. So it's, it's a salad of everything, but it's all well planned. So I don't do this anymore. Uh, development, uh, transverse, finish with it, vertical finish. I don't do this because it's a waste of time. And as long as you keep your forces low, then you can do everything at the same time. At, this, at the mark of the seventh month, I'm, uh, I'm in 14.25 terminal upper and lower. The patient still has, okay, ha uh, always remember to focus on his chin, on his lip incompetence, but look at the smile. And I'm always also taking this, uh, the, the profile smile so I can see the inclination of the front teeth. I'm still not in the, I haven't dumped the front teeth forward, okay? They're even better, they're even uh, uh, more upright. On the seventh, this is the seventh month, so class two is on the left, on the right side, is getting to a class one. On the right side, it needs more work, more expansion on the upper and the lower. On the ninth month, I'm into an 18.25, Class three, uh, upper right side, so I can correct the uh, midline discrepancy, but I can s now see the, 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 the arches develop more. I'm gonna develop more the arches when I'm in 1925 or 1825 stainless steel. But things are looking re really good. Look at the overjet. It's close to normal overjet now. On the 10th month, I'm in 1825 upper and lower, and I, I've used one buckle shelf screw on the lower right side, so I can help with the midline, okay? 
patient is getting a little bit tired with the elastic, so I thought I, I want to help him a little bit, you know, tell him to, to stop wearing the elastics for a couple of months on one side. So I've placed the uh, buckle shelf screw, and this is on the 11th month. Now he is able to seal his lips. Why? Because I've, you know, brought back the upper and the lower incisors inside. So the bimaxillary protrusion on the upper and the lower is almost gone at this level. And look at the inclination, the emergence profile on the upper central incisors. They're not proclined, they're even straight, and they're going to get even straighter now. On the, this is the 1825. I'm continuing with the micro implant, correction of the class two, and the midline shift. Arches are getting even better now, the shape and the transfers. Month 16, I haven't seen him for five months because it was COVID. So, uh, but I was, I was a little bit, you know, uh, stressed what's going to happen to him with those wires. If you leave the 1825 Terminal Ultra and you leave it for five months, the patient's going to come back with a beautiful, beautiful arch form. Beautiful arch form. And this is what happened. Month 16, 1725 stainless steel on the upper and the lower. Look at the position of, this, of the upper front teeth. The class two corrected on both sides, now it's class one. I still have a little bit of midline discrepancy to correct. Upper arch is expanded. And one thing I tell all the people who question the expansion, you can't expand more than the patient gives you. So even if I take a straight line in 1925 stainless steel, straight 1925, place it inside the brackets from one tube to another, straight, okay? It's not gonna develop more than the patient would give you. It's impossible. So this is what the development of the arches gave me. I'm happy with it. Month 18, upper 1825 stainless steel, expanded, lower 1725, short class three. Whenever I switch to rectangular night eye or stainless steel, I upgrade my elastics to 3.5 and 4.5. I tend not to use more than that. I don't go above five ounce because I don't want to tax my system. I need to respect the torque expression. And this is at month 21. Look at the chin. He has a little bit of definition of the chin. It's not completely erased now, okay? It, it looks like his chin moved forward a little bit. His smile is much better. It's following the shape of the lower arch. Class one on both sides, a little bit more correction on the upper right side. This is after two years, expansion, retraction, over correction, well expanded rounded, rounded upper and, and lower arch, midlines almost on, and this is the month 27, final seating, just before debonding, and this is the final result. This is the debonding day, okay? I told you to look at the second premolar on the upper right side, it's so small, that's why I couldn't get the class one 100% on the right side, midlines are on, you, after all the expansion that I did, teeth on the lateral segment, they don't look like they tipped buckly. So I'm still respecting everything. Even the chin is much better now. He can seal his lips. His smile is really nice. And look at the straightness of the upper central incisors. This is how he was. This is how he is now. I did some tissue trimming. You know, just to harmonize all the gingival levels. And this is one month after debonding. Okay? He's very happy. He can seal his lips. And his uh, uh, peers or his friends, they don't know what we did. They thought that he went through some kind of surgical uh, treatment or, or uh, something like that, or a, a genioplasty. And this is, the, this is the step that I wanted to, to, to talk to you about. So if I show you this step, before I show you the previous pictures, you would tell me, ah, come on, are you joking? This is, a, this is an extraction case, but look at this. Is this an extraction case to, to you now? To me, it's not. So don't be fooled by cephalometric analysis. The, the, the numbers are there to guide you, but not to tell you what to do. So this is before and after. And I tend to ask my patients to do the final x-rays before we debond, because I've had so many patients that we debonded, and they went. I had never saw them again. They didn't uh, get me the, the, the x-rays. So now I have a tendency, just the day they come for debonding, I have my final x-rays. 
So now that's the second case. Uh, it's a regular uh, severe crowding case. She's 15 years old. Both canines, she doesn't like them because they're sticking out, okay? And we have moderate plus crowding on the lower, severe uh, crowding on the upper. Challenge in this case is to create space for the canines without proclination of the upper incisors. And remember what I told you about the system? I have confidence in it. So how do I prevent, remember what type of orthodontist I want to be? I don't want to get into trouble and then try to solve it later. I want to eliminate the troubles that I might face. So how am I going to solve the problem of creating space for the canine without proclining the upper incisor? Two things. One, low force. Three things. One, very low forces that work over long periods of time. Two, I bond high, close to the gingiva at six, 6.5, seven millimeters sometimes. Yes. It makes a big difference because I'm closer to the center of resistance. So the moment that I get is much less. Three, I flip the upper central and lateral brackets. That's the recipe. Three things, low forces, bonding closer to the gingiva, three, flipping. So I get the negative torque. So 14 thermal ultra, the sequence is always the same. 14, 18, 14, 25, 18, 25, that's the family of the Thermal Ultra. After that, 19, 25 stainless steel on the upper, 18 or 17, 25 stainless steel on the, on the lower. I open a parenthesis now, and I give you like a nota bene, or a alert, or a red flag. Whenever you flip brackets, whenever you flip brackets, don't go beyond 17, 25 stainless steel. The genius system is so powerful at expressing the torque that sometimes if you flip the upper brackets, the front teeth, and you stick in the 1925 stainless steel, the patient comes after three months, you put your index, and you feel the roots on the upper anterior teeth or the lower if you, you know, add a lot of torque. So it's so powerful at torque expression. Before, I had torque problems. Now, so much torque, I don't know what to do with it. So I've learned over the past two, three years from my mistakes that when I flip, I don't go beyond 1725. Or always check with your finger the roots of the upper central incisors and the laterals. So this is third month, 14 thermal ultra. I wanted to get the canine quickly, so I tie at a distance. And 12 thermal ultra on the upper, 18 on the lower. And I help the canine come down with a very light elastic. That's wrong. That's a mistake that I did. Why? Because I know that my 12 thermal ultra is so low with force expression, I need to let it bring down the canine. The, la the, the elastic should go either on the first premolar, so that I don't let it erupt a little bit or intrude a little bit, or it should go on the anterior teeth so I can control the cant. So that's a mistake I did. Please uh, learn from it. So this is 18. 1825, the canine is in place. Now, after one year, a lot of doctors can debond here. I can debond. But the time that I saved by getting the, 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 uh, the, uh, the case into very good alignment, I can use to finish. And now I'm obsessed with the finishing. I'm obsessed with, you know, what Dr. Marco showed about the veneers. If I want to have a good result at the end, I want my front teeth to look like veneers. I don't want the patient to go after 10 years and do veneers with respect to all restorative dentists. So I'm going to spend the extra six months finalizing the case, trimming the contact points, reshaping, trying to, to get a better color, get a better architectural gingival display. So that's how I succeed with my cases. It's not only about alignment. And this is at the 18th month finishing. 20 month, she missed a couple of months because she was away from the country, and that's the finishing case, the finishing result. It looks like she needs bleaching. It looks like she did like a yellow kind of veneers. I'm happy with it, okay? She's, she's radiant with that smile. So I did some tissue trimming, tissue contouring, contouring of the embrasure, and uh, I, have a, uh, I have a laser machine in the clinic. I don't use it. I use a tissue trimming burr. It's a ceramic burr. I don't have a picture. It's a ceramic burr. It costs about 50 euros. And I use it without water, 
even without anesthesia, and I can trim even hyperplastic gingiva. I don't want to wait for my brother to come uh, to Dubai or to send the patient, so I have to do it quickly at the debonding day. And that's the final look at the position of the upper and the lower incisors, full respect of the biological envelope. And that's four days post-tissue trimming. The gums are healing better. Beautiful lateral finishing. I spend a lot of time on finishing, a lot of time. Third case, 25-year-old. He's the wife of my assistant. Uh, he's the husband of my assistant. So he came to me, he said, look, doctor, uh, I, don't have money for the <laughs> I don't have money for the surgery, and can we do something? And I said, of course, we can do something. So th the key point in this case is to just to jump the bite. But if we jump the bite and we put a night eye wire on the upper, what's going to happen to the upper teeth? They're going to flare. I've treated so many class three cases. They're really well done. But when I look at the Ceph at the end and at the smile of the patient at the end, the upper incisors are flared, the lower incisors are retroclined. This is typical decompensation of any class three. This is how we used to do things. But it doesn't look nice when the patient smiles. The more you procline the upper anterior teeth, the less the light will hit them, the, the less uh, beautiful the smile would look. If you want the light to shed and to, uh, at, uh, um, to, to attack the upper front teeth, all of it, they need to be upright. So the challenge in this case is how to use class three mechanics without proclining the upper incisors and retroclining the lower incisors. Easy, one prescription. I'm gonna flip the upper brackets upside down to keep them upright, and I'm gonna flip the lower incisors upside down. Because the lower brackets on the genius, they have minus six. With class three elastics, they're gonna retrocline even more. So I'm gonna flip the lower incisors, the lower brackets flipped are going to give me plus six, so they're going to stay upright even if I use class three elastics. And there's a small thing that I did to speed up uh, the process of the class three correction. So you see, I like how they are upright, the lower incisors. And the upper incisors, if I can, I can finish the case with this kind of inclination, it would be nice. So from the first, First, till the fifth month, I'm in 14 heat activated thermal ultra. I'm not gonna change it. I like the wire. And the expansion, the biological expansion that you get, that the bony housing and the envelope can accept is with the low uh, size wires. Okay, now, if you try to expand, with, with, with the, expand the upper arch or the lower arch with heavy arch wires, uh, you know, you have to be very careful. But the stable expansion that you get in the transverse, you get it with round wires. You don't get it with anything else because it's a low force. And the Thermal Ultra gives me about 25 to 28 grams per two millimeters of activation. I don't need more than that. So I jump the bite with uh, by, tu by turbos or, or ramps on the back, okay? And then use of class three elastics, short, very, very short class three, two to 2.5 uh, ounce. And after that, on the sixth month, I wanted to retract the whole lower arch backward. So I used two retromolar, uh, retromolar mini screws, 2.0 uh, diameter, 10 millimeter length in the retromolar area because I asked him to uh, extract the, uh, the third molars as we started the treatment. And after that, on the seventh month, I'm in edge to edge. Eight month, 18 heat activated on the upper. Nine month, 1425 upper and lower. The bite had jumped. Class three is corrected. Okay, now I can take brackets. I can take them off at this point. But when the patient comes at the month 10, he stands on the wall, I take a picture and I see how much upper incisors he show. If he shows the whole upper incisors, I can debunk. But the problem with the class three is that they don't show upper incisors. It's too much compensated, you know, proclined upper incisors. So on the 12th month, look at the flipped upper brackets and the flipped lower brackets on the anterior teeth. 1925 on the upper because I want to get that torque. And here, now I know I should not go more than 1725 on the upper. 
13th month, I'm seating the occlusion with vertical elastics. 14 month, it's well seated, closing all the spaces. 16 month, I'm over correcting. Now I go back to 1825 and I start repositioning. And I don't mind repositioning. I've been practicing orthodontics for 20 years and I still reposition. I'm not perfect, so what? Okay, if I can use indirect bonding, that's fine, but it's gonna increase my cost, and I think some of my patients cannot pay. I, I would rebond. Now I would rebond on the second appointment, third appointment. I don't wait for the 1825. The patient comes after two months, there's something wrong with the bonding, I remove and I rebond. I rebond two times, three times, four times, as many times as I need to get a perfect fit at the end. So now I'm trying to extrude the upper incisors as much as I can, and this is the just before the debonding. What I wanted to get, I got it. Straight lower incisors, not retrocline. Straight upper incisors, no compensation. It feels like this patient came for to do nothing. If you don't see the previous pictures, this is from zero up to 17 months. And this is the lower. And now he's showing all his upper incisors and the laterals. Now I'm gonna work more on the gingiva. So I'm going to trim on the canine, on the laterals, okay? And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna round those canine points because I don't like the canine to be too much pointy, even in men. Uh, we used to learn in restorative dentistry that men like uh, pointy canines. No, they don't like, we like them, dentists, but they don't like them. They like this flow from the front to the back, okay? So the, 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 the central incisor introduces the lateral, the lateral introduces the canine. It's like, it's, it's like a one piece, it's like a, a veneer style, but the color is less than what I want. And look at him smiling. Okay. And this is the superimposition. It's like I just cut the ceph and move them, the upper one forward and the mandible backward without doing anything. And I, you know, when I, when I started using Genius, I didn't know that I'm gonna get this kind of results. You know, I, I'm not trying to brag, okay? But these things, I got them because the system is so good. And I know how to, to put, I'm an orthodontist. I need to know how to put a treatment plan. But you need the system. I'm not Federer, remember. I need a system that can help me become a better orthodontist. And this is the last case. He's 17 years old. He's going into med school. Okay. Uh, his uh, chief complaint is I have a twisted smile. And, you know, those cant of the occlusal plane, I used to treat them with micro implant. Because you know, sometimes if, a, if I don't place a micro implant in the clinic, I feel that there's something wrong, okay? Because I, I need to always train myself, never lose the habit of placing those micro implants. So he said, my, my smile is twisted. Can't, open bite, tendency to class three, edge to edge, all kinds of problem in this case. So, month one, I want to, okay, I'm gonna go back. I told you that I'm obsessed a little bit with the smile. He doesn't show his, he doesn't show upper incisors. He shows, he's 17. If I'm gonna finish the case with this kind of display, this amount, when he's 27 and the doctor, and he's probably gonna stand and lecture, he's gonna look 45. So first, I'm going to increase the vertical dimension. I'm gonna put band lock on the upper so I can increase the open bite in the front and extrude the front teeth more than that. So you see now, when I bonded the, 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 uh, the, the, the case, the open bite is bigger. Why? Because I placed band lock on the upper. I want to increase the open bite, but close it by slow movement of the anterior teeth. How? By using this, we call it uh, rainbow elastic. It's two ounce rainbow elastic and class three elastics on the side, okay? Because I want to control the position of the lower incisors. Month two, the bite is starting to close. I flip the upper incisors upside down, flip the lower incisors upside down because I'm treating this case as a class three. Fourth, mo uh, fourth month, class three elastics with short class two to correct the midline and the cant. 14 terminal ultra for five months. I'm not in a hurry. If the, if the wire is gonna give me everything, I'm gonna take it. Six months, a little bit of uh, gingival contouring for the laterals because I rebonded them even higher. So even at the six month, I'm starting to rebond. Why? Because I wanna show more of his anterior teeth. 1425 terminal ultra, when he smiles, it's now more symmetrical. Beautiful art shape on the upper and the lower. I have some spaces on the upper, I'm gonna close them. This is very easy. 
okay? And I place 2020 now. I like to work with 2020 Terminal Ultra because I can get torque expression with less force than the 1925. So I expand and I put the 2020 and I le leave it there. Eight months, 2020, short class two, class three to correct the midline. Nine months, still with the 2020 on the upper 1425, okay? And I palpate the roots. I'm not taking the roots out of their envelope, bony envelope. 11th month, 1725 on the upper and the lower. Let it cook for a couple of months. This is the final result. In 11 months, I, I, it used to take two years with me, these kind of cases. So now I did some tissue trimming, fixed retention on the upper and the lower, and I use this. Thank you, Charlie, for sending me this last year. So this is the shoe. I advise you to get it. It's the shoe gauge. I can measure how much the size and the width of the tooth should be in comparison to its length, okay? And it's very easy. It's, it's gauged, so the canine should be on the uh, black marks, the lateral incisor on the blue, and the central on the red. So I know how much gum should I remove or how much on the incisal border should I add composite or send him for veneers. So after doing a little bit of gingival contouring, look at his smile, stable, beautiful inclination, beautiful torque control when I flip the upper and the lower, 11 months. What did I do? Change wires, weight, and use the elastics as early as day one to guide where the night eye opened spaces for me. So Dr. Carlo Bonapache said that in Damon, they say we extract for the face, but not for the space. And you said we extract sometimes for the space. And I'm gonna add one phrase. It's a race for space. You need to expand before they procline. So it's a race. Teeth like to move. So if you get the expansion first, the front teeth won't go uh, forward. So it's a race for space. Where you're going to find the space is very important. Night eye terminal ultra are going to expand your arches. Those small spaces, you're going to guide them with the early elastics. So 11 month, 10 appointments. So. I was trapped like a mouse in that. High resistance to sliding, excessive force, slow tooth movement, unwanted side effects, and this circle goes on and on and on. But now, because I was this guy, I, I, I mean, I'm not this guy, I was this guy. This is the CEO of Nokia. In 2013, he was crying, he said, they sold Nokia to Microsoft. He said, we didn't do anything wrong, but that, uh, that's the problem. You didn't do the right thing. I was doing what I was told, what I was trained. I was doing the right thing. I was not doing the proper thing for every patient. I don't want to end up like this. So I'm proposing a new circle. It's the happiness circle. It's not the vicious circle. So you have the 21, 25, tw uh, 21 and a half, 27 and a half. Perfect precision in the slot that gives you confidence. It's a user-friendly beautiful control and efficiency. Final thoughts, if you want to succeed at your cases, you need to take uh, appreciation of the shape and the color and the smile. People look at each other in the front. So it's the front teeth, it's the upper incisors that matters the most, not the lower, not the lower. Thank you so much.